we have a big one now. Now we're talking about compression ratio. And compression ratio is so important that it's so overlooked. So we're gonna make sure that you get a good understanding of how this compression ratio is working. Understanding how this compression ratio works helps you understand what's happening with the whole entire system. It also helps you understand when conditions are changing, what kind of work that's putting on the compressor. Now, ideally, you should have already watched the TD video before this, that temperature difference between two different. It's gonna help you understand what's happening. This video is gonna build on that video. So let's get started with compression ratio. So this compressor is going to be sucking in a low pressure vapor and pumping out a high pressure vapor. It sucks low pressure vapor, pumps out high pressure vapor, it moves the refrigerant. Remember, it is that vapor pump, but there's a lot that goes into that. The compression ratio is a big part of how much work the compressor is doing. If we have a very low compression ratio, I can pull low pressure vapor, pump high pressure vapor, and I can do that very quickly, very effectively, and I can move a lot to refrigerant by doing that. But what happens as the outdoor temperature and the outdoor pressure starts to rise? As it goes up, we have to suck in that low pressure vapor, and then we have to pump it up to that higher pressure and push it higher and higher as that temperature goes. Now I'm having to do more work. But what happens if we drop the indoor temperature and the suction pressure? Now we're having to go down lower to pick up the suction pressure and then up higher to pump it out. That's what we call a large compression ratio. Notice how I'm not gonna be able to move as much refrigerant, it's a lot more work. Imagine if you had to go up and down a ladder moving boxes versus just moving boxes like this. It's going to slow you down. So as that compression ratio grows larger, it's a lot more work for this compressor to do. So the next thing is, let's look at how we're going to calculate compression ratio. So we're gonna have our suction gauge and we're gonna have our head gauge or high pressure gauge. So it's gonna be measuring the suction pressure coming in and the discharge pressure coming out. But there's a little bit of a catch. Remember back when we talked about these gauges? These are pressure differential devices. So it's measuring the difference between the pressure of the hose versus the pressure on the outside. So right now it's showing zero PSI gauge. And this other side is also showing zero PSI gauge. But in reality, there's still pressure on it. It's just the pressure in the hose side and the pressure in the air side is equal. There's no pressure difference. But what we need to do when we're working with compression ratio is we have to convert this to what we call absolute pressure. In other words, we need to take into account the pressure that's on us right now. You at home are under pressure, not just from your work and school and studying, but from the pressure of the atmosphere. So let's look at it this way. Here's a piece of metal that's one inch by one inch. So if I put this metal against my hand, this would be one square inch of pressure. It's pushing down one PSI. This is literally the definition of one PSI. Now what happens when I add another one of these on top of this? I would end up with two PSI. At sea level, typically we have 14.7 pounds of pressure pushing on us every single inch. So every inch of you, there's 14.7 of these at atmospheric pressure. This gauge reads that as zero. It's reading the pressure inside and outside as being zero, but in reality, there's 14.7 at sea level, under general conditions. What happens if we go up in the altitude? We go up into the mountains. Well, as we go up into the mountains, there's less stacks of air on top of us. So the pressure becomes less. So if you're checking the absolute pressure in say Colorado, you're gonna get a different number than absolute pressure at sea level. Also, if that's not enough variables, your sea level pressure isn't gonna be the same either. It's going to vary depending on your weather conditions. Also, there's other things that take into account. What if you're working below sea level, like Death Valley or the Dead Sea? Those are well below sea level, so you're having more pressure on those. So how can you know what your sea level is? I use a little device like this. This cool little device here, when I turn it on, it gives me my PSI, A, my atmospheric pressure. So right now on me, at this point, I have 13 0.7 PSI of pressure on me right now. So I'm a little bit above sea level, but during the conditions right now, I know exactly what my pressures are. So that's the number that I'm going to use. However, if you're taking a test, any test that you take, they're going to want to know atmospheric conditions. So anytime you see a test asking about absolute pressure, simply do this, add 14.7 on every single HVAC test I've taken. However, if you're gonna do this in reality, you're gonna need to know the true pressure. For example, right now, there's only 13.7 PSI on me. If I went up into the mountains, there'd be even less PSI. So that does affect it. Now these tools are expensive, it's a luxury to have. You can also get the barometric pressure and convert that as well. 
The engineering toolbox has a great amount of different formulas and calculators to help you find that information out, but there's ways of doing it. It's not like you're gonna be calculating this on every job. You're not gonna be going out and say, oh, I need to do my compression ratio. This is really important for you to understand that concept though. The atmospheric pressure plays a part in this. So my gauge pressure is zero PSI gauge. How would we convert that to atmospheric pressure? We'd add 14.7. So if I add 14.7, the PSI absolute would be 14.7. Same thing with the red side. Now, what if I had 100 PSI on the suction side? What would that be in absolute? Well, we'd add 14.7. So 100 plus 14.7 is 114.7. We've now converted to absolute. I can do the same thing on my high side. What if I had 200 PSI gauge here on this side, how would you convert that to atmospheric pressure? Would be 200 plus 14.7, or in reality what your real pressure is, in this case, it would be 214.7 PSI absolute, including atmospheric pressure. So that's how you convert it from gauge pressure to absolute pressure. So when we're checking a system, we're seeing our suction pressure pulling in and our high side pressure pushing out, the compression ratio is gonna be between those two numbers. And again, 14.7 you're gonna see with most tests. Now that's only giving us our absolute pressure coming in and our absolute pressure coming out, including atmospheric pressure. But still, it doesn't tell us how we find compression ratio. But it does, it's one step closer. Once we know our absolute pressures, we divide it. I take my high side pressure, divide my suction side pressure, and that's gonna be our compression ratio. Just a little bit of math. So in this case, let's do the example that we had. Pull out your calculator and do it with me. We said that we had 215.7 PSIA on our high side, on the red side, the high end, the red gauge, converted to absolute. We're going to divide that by 117.5 for our low side, the suction side. So once we do that math, we end up with a compression ratio of 1.8357. We could round that to 1.84 to one compression ratio. That'd be a very low compression ratio. We're able to move a lot of refrigerant very, very, very quickly and very easily. So the lower that compression ratio is, the easier this compressor can work and the more movement of refrigerant it can do. Now let's run through some numbers. We learned about our scary, scary math. Let's apply it through a variety of different situations and see what we come up with. So let's do some scary, scary math. We need a starting point. So the starting point I'm gonna use is called AHRI, which is Air Conditioning Heating Refrigeration Institute. They're the ones that establish the testing parameters. So when they test all HVAC equipment, they test it at an 80 degree return air temperature. In other words, an 80 degree indoor temperature with 50% relative humidity and the outdoor temperature of 95 degrees Fahrenheit. So all the equipment's test under those conditions to see how efficient they're working and how well they perform. So we're gonna start with those test conditions because it's a baseline. So if we look at these test conditions, Knowing what we learned about with TD, an 80 degree return air temperature, the difference in the refrigerant is gonna be about 35 degrees less than that, in most cases, generally speaking. So if we take an 80 degree return air temperature, minus 35, we end up with a 45 degree Fahrenheit saturated temperature. Regardless of refrigerant, that's gonna be our saturated temperature. On the outside unit, we have a 95 degree Fahrenheit outdoor conditions. Our temperature difference being approximately 15 degree TD, we end up with a 110 degree saturated temperature. So now that we know our saturated temperatures, we can then convert that to pressures. Now I know most of the time I've been telling you, convert PSIG to a saturated temperature. We don't need pressure. This is gonna be one of the rare instances that we do need pressure. So we're gonna be converting saturated back. It also is prepare you for the EPA test, which requires you to do some of these different calculations. So you can use a temperature pressure chart. I am using the Forain app, so if you wanna follow along, that's the app I'm using. So you're gonna need the app and also a calculator for the scary, scary math. So let's take a look at what we have. A 45 degree saturated temperature with HFC R22 refrigerant, that 45 degree saturated temperature converts to a pressure of 76 PSI gauge, where you're seeing on your blue gauge. But we need to convert that to an absolute pressure, including atmospheric. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna add 14.7. So we're gonna put in our calculator 76 plus 14.7, and you should get a number pretty close to 90.7. That's gonna be 90.7 PSI 
absolute, including atmospheric pressure. So that's one of our numbers. We're almost there. Now let's do the high side, the red gauge. So that red gauge is going to be approximately 110 degrees Fahrenheit. We take our HCFC R22, convert that 110 degree saturated temperature into a pressure, and that pressure should be 226 PSI gauge, the red gauge. But we need to convert that to absolute pressure by adding atmospheric pressure, 14.7. So we're going to get our calculator and we're going to take 226 PSI gauge plus 14.7 PSI atmospheric, and we get an absolute pressure, a total pressure, a real pressure of 240.7 PSIA. Now that we have our PSIAs, we can now divide it, find our compression ratio. So in your calculator, you're going to take and put 240.7, divide 90.7, and hit the equal sign. By the time that you round it, you should end up with something pretty close to 2.65. So the compression ratio will be at 2.65 to 1 compression ratio. With our higher efficiency systems, with R22, under design conditions, these being the design conditions, that's how much work a compressor is doing. 2.65, it's moving a lot of refrigerant and those conditions. Our indoor temperature is pretty high, our outdoor temperature is fairly low. It's able to move a lot of refrigerant very quickly. Imagine you're moving boxes. You can take and move those boxes very quick and very efficient. Now let's look at a different system. Let's look at a system designed for R410A. Now when I say it's designed for R410A, they've made adjustments. They have a different oil in it. They have a different volume in the compressor. Since 410A is more energy efficient, it's a more efficient refrigerant, it ends up needing a smaller compressor. So inside this 410A system, it has a smaller compressor, a smaller pump action. Palacio has a video showing the comparison between an R22 and 410A. I'll put the link in below, but you can't just put 410A in an R22 system. You're gonna end up with a total different volumetric efficiencies and a whole lot more goes into that. So we're using a system designed for 410A. Let's redo those numbers. We're gonna take HFC 410A. Notice in HFC, there's no chlorine molecule, but we're gonna take 410A and we're still gonna use our same saturated temperature. It's our same design condition. It's still gonna be designed for that. So we take 45 degrees with our 410A and convert that to a pressure. So we're gonna be working a little bit backwards, but we convert that to a pressure, 45 converts to a suction saturated pressure of 130 PSI gauge, that's the blue gauge. But what is that really gonna be? We need to modify that, we need absolute. So what are we gonna do? Add 14.7. So we're gonna take 390 PSI gauge and we're gonna add 14.7 for atmospheric pressure and that gives us an absolute, a total pressure of 144.7 PSIA. So now we have our PSIA. Now let's do the other side. So the other side's 110 degrees saturated. We take HFC 410A, convert 110 degrees saturated temperature and that gives us a pressure of 366 PSI gauge, the red gauge, the head pressure, the liquid gauge. That pressure needs to be converted to absolute. So we're going to add 14.7 PSI atmospheric pressure and that gives us a PSI absolute of 380.7. That's our absolute pressure. Now notice that I have all these numbers up. I had to do all these numbers twice. I kind of struggle with dyslexia, so I have to really double check my numbers. If you're not doing it this fast, it's okay. It took me a long time to write all these numbers. That's why I have all this little cardboard up here, because I have to double check my numbers. But the more that you do the math, the easier that it comes to you. I used to hate it, but now I've learned it's okay. I just have to, for me, double check my numbers. But once I do that, the math gives you so much solutions. It tells you what's happening. So don't be afraid of the math. Try it out. Be sure to pause the video and do the math yourself. The more you do it, the easier it is. The great thing is, if you mess up, there's nobody to know. So you can practice it. You're hearing the right answers here. And who knows? With my dyslexia, maybe some of these numbers are wrong. So just follow along and practice. The more you do it, the easier it comes. So we take 380.7 PSI absolute divided by 144.7 PSI absolute. That gives us a compression ratio of 2.63 to 1. 2.63 to 1. Well, let's take a look at that. It's actually a lower compression ratio than R22. We got 2.65 to 1 and 2.63 to 1, and the compressor size of that pump is actually smaller. How cool is that? I think that's quite interesting. Here's another thing let's look at. Let's look at the high side, 226 compared to 366. There's a big difference. Let's look at the suction side, 76 versus 130. 
that's a big number. There's a whole lot more pressure with 410A. Shouldn't it be working a lot harder on that compressor? That's where the beauty of compression ratio comes in. It doesn't care how high the high side is, the low side is also higher. So it's able to have the same, or in this case, even lower compression ratio. So it's not that a refrigerant has high pressure we're concerned about. We're concerned about the difference between the high side and the low side. That's where the compression ratio comes in. Now it's also important to note right here that the compression ratio is not telling us how many BTUs we're moving. It's not telling us how many pounds of refrigerant. It's just telling how efficient or how effective that compressor is able to work under those conditions. And if those conditions change, our compression ratio is gonna to change too. Very simply, we can see under design conditions or test conditions, we end up with pretty close to the same compression ratio. For today is actually a little bit less, so it's easier to do work. There's less of a lift that has to do. Now let's take a look at what would happen if we had a different set of conditions. Remember we're using a higher efficiency unit. That means that we've added 15 degrees to our saturated temperature. So our saturated temperature is 15 degrees higher than the air temperature. But they're able to do that by having large condensing coils. So by having a larger condensing coil, we're able to change the same amount of heat without having to have the temperature difference. But before that, we had to get all that heat out by having an even higher temperature difference. So the refrigerant or the saturated temperature had to be much higher than the temperature of the air. Smaller condensing coil, but it used more energy to make. It was also cheaper to manufacture because it's less copper and aluminum, but it used more electricity to make that happen. So in the old days, we had a 30 degree temperature difference. So whatever the air temperature was, the refrigerant was 30 degrees higher than that. So to get that 30 degree higher temperature, we had to have a higher pressure. Let's take a look at what that would be. So here we kept everything are inside the same, an 80 degree indoor temperature day. So we have all of our numbers are gonna be the same here. So all I did was just carry them straight across and use our exact same numbers. But what did change is everything on our high side. So it's gonna be an older system, system from say the 80s. So we're gonna up with a smaller condensing coil. So to get all that heat to leave, we have to have a bigger temperature difference. Remember back in thermodynamics, what affects the speed of the second law of thermodynamics is the material it's made of. So we already have aluminum, so great heat transfer. Also surface area. So in the older days, we had less surface area. To get that heat to transfer to less surface area, we needed a bigger temperature difference. So the temperature difference between the two would be much higher. So surface area and also the amount of airflow that we're flowing through it. So in this case, we're gonna go back to a system from the 80s. So with that 95 degree outdoor temperature, smaller condensing coil, we ended up with a 30 degree temperature difference, a much higher pressure to get us there. So 95 degree outdoor day, we had a 30 degree TD. So we had a much higher temperature of that saturated to get the same amount of heat to leave. Smaller unit, cheaper to make the unit, but let's see how much more energy that's gonna cost. So here we have 95 degrees plus our 30 degree TD. We end up with a saturated temperature of 125 degrees. Let's convert that to pressure. So for R22, HCFC R22, 125 converts to a saturated temperature of 278 PSI gauge. Ooh, notice it went up. It was over here at 226, and now we're all the way up to 278. That's a big difference. Let's add our 14.7, and we end up with 292.7 absolute pressure. We take 292.7 PSIA divided by 90.7 PSIA, because we already did that math, and we end up with a compression ratio of 3.23 to 1. Ooh, a lot higher. Our compression ratio was 2.65, and now we're at 3.23. That's a much higher compression ratio. So now instead of us moving boxes or moving refrigerant like this, now we're moving boxes over here to a much higher pressure, and it takes a lot more work. Now I'm having to do more work between each movement. I'm moving less boxes. The compressor overall is moving less refrigerant, trying to get that higher pressure up. So even though we have a higher saturated temperature, a higher TD, we end up with a much higher compression ratio. We're overall doing less work using more electricity. Let's look at that for 410A. We take HFC 410A at 125 degrees saturated temperature. That converts to a pressure of 448 PSI gauge. Plus 14.7, we end up with 426.7 PSI absolute. 
we take 426.7 PSI absolute divided by 144.7 PSI absolute for suction, and that gives us a compression ratio of 3.20. Still a little bit more efficient than the R22, but we went up significantly, 3.20 compared to our 2.63. That's a big change. That's a big change. So this is why they make condensing units larger. By having more surface area, we're able to have a smaller temperature difference. So now instead of having that 30 degree temperature difference, we have this 15 degree temperature difference, TD, and that's able to lower our saturated temperature, which also lowers our head pressure, which lowers our compression ratio. Hopefully that helps give you an idea of why these systems are larger physically now. Let's take a look at another example though. Instead of having a 30 degree TD, what if we were to use a system with a 15 degree TD, so we'll put plus 15, a higher efficiency unit, and we were to have our outdoor temperature being 110 degrees. Is it possible to have a 110 degree outdoor temperature? Absolutely, I've lived in Las Vegas and I guarantee you it exceeds that, well and beyond exceeds that. So as the outdoor temperature goes up, even though it's only a 15 degree temperature difference, we still have to raise the pressure to account for that. So if you notice this system, 110 degree outdoor temperature plus 15 degree TD, we also end up with 125 degrees saturated temperature. So even with a high efficiency system, and that system's running in say Las Vegas, and you had an 80 degree temperature inside your house, and you had a 110 degree temperature outside your house, which is definitely possible, and exceeds, you would end up with your higher compression ratio of 3.23 for R22, and 3.20 for 410A. So as that outdoor temperature goes up, you're having to still stack more refrigerant. So could you imagine if it was a system that's older that had a 30 degree TD on top of it being 110, you're really having to work to get that pressure up there. So all of this affects it. This is why it's so important to understand that the outdoor temperature affects the outdoor pressure. And as we're trying to pump higher and higher, that compressor has to do a lot more work. But that's not all. Let's take a look at what would happen if we were to change our indoor temperature. We're gonna keep our same AHRI outdoor conditions. So 95 degree outdoor temperature at our 110 degree saturated temperature with our 15 degree TD. And all of these numbers are gonna be the same. I just brought them straight over. So we don't have to do that math again. Now what I did change was the return air temperature. Instead of having 80 degree air hitting that evaporator coil, we now have a 70 degree air hitting that evaporator coil. We still have our 35 degree TD or design temperature difference between the air and the refrigerant. So if we take 70 minus 35, that gives us a saturated temperature, a boiling temperature of 35 degrees Fahrenheit. Notice how as the return air temperature dropped, our saturated temperature also dropped. Now let's take a look at what that does to the compression ratio. We take our HCFC R22, 35 degrees saturated temperature, and that converts to a suction pressure of 61 PSI gauge. We add our 14.7 atmosphere. That gives us our new absolute pressure of 75.7 PSIA absolute. So we take our 240.7 existing PSIA that we already did, divide it by our new 75.7 PSIA that we just got, and that gives us a compression ratio of 3.18. So notice as we drop the indoor temperature, we also end up raising the compression ratio. So even though I only have a 95 degree outdoor pressure I'm pumping into, I'm now having to reach down lower. I'm having to go down here, much lower to grab that refrigerant and then bring it up. So as the indoor temperature drops, that also affects our compression ratio. Our compression ratio is much higher. What else is important to know about that is gonna be the density of the refrigerant. That refrigerant is gonna be less dense at that lower pressure, so there's less molecules of refrigerant and also less oil as well. So these systems have to be designed for these higher compression ratios. So here having that lower temperature, it's a lot more work on the compressor. We can see it in the compression ratio. Let's do that with 410A. HFC 410A of 35 degree saturated temperature gives us a pressure of 107 plus our 14.7 PSI atmosphere, gives us an absolute pressure of 121.7 PSIA. So we take our existing 380.7 PSI absolute, divide it by 121.7 PSI absolute suction, gives us a compression ratio of 3.13. Notice that our compression ratio is still lower, but it's pretty close in there. Still, as we lower that indoor temperature, that's also more work that compressor has to do. So the lower you have the temperature set in your house, the less effective, the less refrigerant you're gonna be able to move because the more work that compressor is having to do. So hopefully that gives you a little idea. But let's change this up even more. What if we were to have this indoor condition 
with this outdoor condition we had in the second example. Let's keep our numbers that we had already, the 70 degree return air temperature, and we're gonna transfer all of these numbers right over here. But let's look at our outdoor conditions. Let's say that we use an older system with a larger TD or, or a more modern system with a lower temperature difference but a higher outdoor temperature. Either way, we're gonna take these conditions we used the second time, we're gonna apply that here as well. And that's compared both extremes. Now let's look at R22. We already did our math, so we have a 75.7 PSI absolute. And on the outside, we already did our math and we have a 292.7 PSI absolute. We divide 292.7 by 75.7, and that gives us a compression ratio of 3.87 to one. So notice that's a lot of work. It's having to pull down very low and pump up very high. So as it's having to do all of this work, it's actually overall moving less volume of refrigerants, a lot more work that compressor's having to do, and it actually reduces the capability of that compressor. Let's take a look at 410A. If we have our outdoor temperature, as our outdoor temperature goes up, our outdoor pressure goes up, we already did our math, so we're gonna use the same number, 462.7 PSI absolute, divided by our numbers we already did here of 121.7 PSI absolute. When you do the math, we end up at 3.80 to one compression ratio. Still more efficient than the R22, not by much, but it's still doing a lot of work. It's having to pull down very low and pump up very high. So this pulling down low, the density of that refrigerant is very low. It's having a hard time gathering up all that refrigerant. Plus there's less oil at that point too. So it's having a hard time gathering all this up. Now it's having to pump against all of this other refrigerant, against this higher temperature, against this higher pressure. It's having to really, really work to make this compression ratio work. So as it's doing that, it's moving overall less refrigerant. So that higher compression ratio means it's a lot more work for the compressor to do. You may have already experienced this with your day-to-day -day life. Think about having to air up a bicycle tire, whether it had that T-handle or that cheesy foot one that always broke on you, but you started out, you had a very low compression ratio. Your tire was flat and you had pretty close to atmospheric pressure. You also had atmospheric pressure on the outside. Your compression ratio was great, it was very low. So as you start compressing and pumping air into that tire, the tire would move significant. It would change very quickly. But as you get more and more pressure in that tire, the higher and higher pressure, you had to work a whole lot harder to make sure you put pressure into that tire. So every time you're doing one pump of that cylinder, you're gaining very little overall pressure in that tire. So you're having to do a whole lot more work. If you ever aired up a car tire, it's the same way. You get those little pumps that you have now, those electric pumps, and you first plug it in and the tire starts going, oh, you're like, oh great, this is fantastic. And then as you get more and more pressure in that tire, it takes longer and longer to get there, as well as the volume of that tire makes a difference as well. But thinking about it, as you first start putting in, you have a very low compression ratio. But as that tire starts to fill up, your compression ratio becomes higher and higher. It's having to do a whole lot more work to move those molecules. So the compressor and refrigeration system is the same. So having a lower indoor temperature and a higher outdoor temperature makes that compressor overall less efficient. It reduces its capacity, it reduces its capability. So we also think about this with your house. As your outdoor temperature goes up, heat's trying to come back into your house. So there's already gonna be heat transfer. But as you have your temperature your house set lower and lower, the faster that heat wants to move. So by having your house at a lower temperature, the heat comes from outside, inside your house at a much faster rate. Now apply compression ratio to that. Now you're having to pump this heat out to a high pressure outside because of the high temperature. And now your temperature inside set much lower, you're having to really dig down and collect that low pressure to be able to pump it out to a high pressure. So you're losing efficiency in your home in two ways. Heat's moving in a lot faster because of the bigger temperature difference and your compressor is having to pump a whole lot harder and moving less overall refrigerant. So having your indoor temperature set lower puts a lot of strain on your AC system and uses a lot more electricity. So these are some of the hows and whys to that. But this is your compression ratio. This is just a few examples. There's unlimited different modules you can apply it to. So practicing it, doing the math, you'll see that it's not so complicated. And just about every test has compression ratio. Now let's take a look at some refrigeration examples.